Last week, we began our three-week series in the Old Testament. Nahum was our first stop. I had mentioned to my son Jacob how many of you shared your joy of the message last week and how impactful it was for you. And I want to quote him. He said, yeah, who'd have thought that so much gloom and doom could be so encouraging? And I thought about that some, and then he followed up. He said, you know, with the 43 verses that are all about destruction, the three verses that showed us how much God loves us and knows us really stood out. And I hope you had that experience as well if you didn't mention it, and quite a few of you did, and that's a good thing. What I, heard, uh, what I hope you heard in that message is the three major points. One was get right with God or face judgment. Preach the gospel to everyone beginning with your family and live like you know that you're saved. Not like you hope to be, but that you are and you live in the joy of Jesus Christ. So this, this week, we move on to Habakkuk. Now, a lot of people don't know how to spell that, let alone say it. So say it all with me. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Good. Okay. So he's another one of the minor prophets. Now, if you use your handy-dandy preaching bookmark, you know exactly where to turn in your Bibles right now. If you don't have one of those, they tell you exactly what we're going to be studying through the end of the year, also the Apollo schedule on the back of it, and it's a great thing at the end of the sermon to then put it where we're going to be studying the following week so that you can do a devotional using that read through at least once or twice. Now, if you didn't bring your own Bible with you, please reach in the seat back in front of you because we are going to spend an inordinate amount of time in uh, the Scripture itself. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, you can read from whichever one you have. Let's start at the beginning where it's good to do in verse 1. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. Stop right there. Just like last week, right off the top, we know who's writing the letter. We know by the word oracle that he's giving us an important announcement or pronouncement. The question is, who's he writing to? Well, as we'll find out in the body of the letter, Habakkuk is writing to Judah to warn them about the impending punishment God is going to bring upon them through the Babylonian Empire. Do you remember the divided kingdom that we talked about? Remember, Israel used to be one big kingdom, and then the guys up north started doing some really weird and funky stuff. They built altars that they weren't supposed to build, and they let in these pagan gods, and they, they started worshiping them, and it, the, the kingdom itself divided, and the northern part was called Israel, and the southern part was called Judah. And what did God do? God says, look, I'm a jealous God. I'm not going to put up with this stuff, and you guys shouldn't either. So he sends the Assyrians in, and the Assyrians take out Israel. And they're living there, and they're tormenting the guys in Judah. And then God says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do now. And you heard this last week. I'm going to send the Babylonians in to take out the Assyrians. Right? And if you remember, their capital city was Nineveh. And that's what we learned last week in Nahum. So he sends the Babylonians there. Well, now we're in Habakkuk, and here's what's happening. God says, hey, look. I've given you every chance you can imagine to straighten up and fly right, and you're not. So now I'm going to let the Babylonians come all the way down into Judah, and they're going to take you out of the land. Because my land is holy, and you won't do unholy things in my land. And that's what Habakkuk is about. Habakkuk's writing about that. Now, if he was just writing to them about that, he would have sent them the Western Union. Tele Do you guys remember that, the telegram from way back in the I even remember that as a kid, right? Um, he would have just said, Babylonians coming, stop. Get out, stop. Right now, stop. That would have been it. But he wants to do more than that. He wants to deliver a message from God but he does it in a really different way because he says, look, I don't get it. 
God, I don't get what it is you're doing or why you're doing it or how you're doing it. So if I ask you some questions, will you answer me? And that's where we're going to start. If you take a look, um, actually, you know what, before I do, let's, let me take a little sidebar here. Let me take a sidebar. I, I mentioned last week that we have to be careful, and again, for those people that are in Apollos, hermeneutically, okay, we have to be careful that we're actually reading what's there and interpreting what's there properly. I made the point last week that we were not Nineveh. God was not writing the letter to us to take us out. Okay, that we are in Nineveh. Well, this week, this Habakkuk is writing to Judah. We are not Judah. But we can learn something from Nahum. We can learn something from Habakkuk. We can learn the lessons that they learned. How many people here were directly in the path of the hurricane that just came through Florida and up the coast? How many of us? Okay, nobody here. So then no one learned anything about disaster preparedness, right? Nobody learned anything whatsoever about what you should do or shouldn't do in a hurricane, right? No, you did. You didn't need to be in that destruction to actually understand a lesson or two, things that you could have learned. Well, that's exactly what's going to happen here in Habakkuk. We are not Judah, but we can learn the lesson that they learned. And we can apply that today and tomorrow. Let's look at verse 2. It says, and, and here's Habakkuk, and he's talking to God. He says, how long, O Lord, will I call for help? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. What are some things we can understand here? Habakkuk is really, really disturbed by sin. What a holy man that he would see all of this sin and it would get under his skin and he would think that God didn't listen or God wasn't working here. How many of us have that same reaction when we see so much sinful stuff in our own family, on our own street, in our own community, even within our own church? How incensed do we get? Or have we just gotten kind of jaded to it all? Well, you know, it's just the way things are. Well, Habakkuk is actually saying, hey, man, like, why, God? Why? How many people here can relate to the cry of Habakkuk's heart when you look at something like what happened in Houston? When you look at something like what happened in Las Vegas? Don't you ask the question in your heart, why? Why is that? What's going on? Why does God allow wicked practices to continue in Judah is what Habakkuk is asking. And for us today, why does God allow so much evil in the world? Anybody besides me ever wonder that? I'll tell you what, as a pastor, probably the question I get asked more than anything else, when somebody comes in my office and sits down and says, my life's a mess, things are bad, why would God allow this to happen? Why? Habakkuk may give us some insight here. Let's, let's think about this for a minute. He just asked the questions here in verse 2 through 4, and look what God does in verse 5. Read it with me. God answering, he says, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I am doing something in your days. I'm doing something in your days. And then <laughs> he says, you would not believe if you were told. Hey, I'm doing some great stuff, but you know what? If I told you about it, you'd say, nah, you couldn't be. No, nah, I don't believe that. No, that doesn't fit what I think you should do. 
It's pretty interesting that God knows the condition of our heart, and he's like, oh, forget about it. I'm not going to tell you. You're Meshuggah. You wouldn't believe it anyway. That's God's Jewish voice. That's how he does that, all right? He's, he's not from Miami. That's the Hebrew side right there, okay? He's, yeah. Meshuggah means you're, you know, a little bit nutty in the head. You don't actually get it. Now, what's interesting about what he says here in verse 5b is it reminds me of what's in Isaiah 55. Take a look at it right there. What does it say? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God, blessedly here through Isaiah, is saying, hey, look, you're not going to get this. You're not going to understand. Remember, I used the, the, the word picture of a mosaic. You're not going to understand why I'm smashing bottles right now to get orange color glass and green color glass and blue colored glass. But when I put all the broken pieces together, look at what a joyful mosaic it's going to make. Look at how we're going we're gonna to stare at it and think it's the greatest thing ever. Can you find Job in your Bibles? Can you find Job? Take a look. It's past Kings and Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, right after Nehemiah, right before you're going to get, if you get to, to Psalms and Proverbs, you've gone too far. Go back to Job. Go back to Job. Now I want you to turn to chapter 38. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things for you because what's interesting is when Job is put upon so so desperately that most of us would have given up Job doesn't and then Job says well finally hey man I've had a lot of this uh God I want you to answer some questions for me except Job because he's put upon so much kind of points a finger at God and says, now answer my questions. Now get it right for me because I don't like what you're doing. How many of us, when we're under a great deal of duress, a great deal of stress, turn to other people and get a little bit like this? But when we're not under as much duress, we say, hey, Faye, could, I don't understand that thing you just mentioned. Could, could you explain that to me? Hey, Ron, uh, I'm a little confused by what you said. Would, would you mind taking a little time and just, just, just feed back to me so that I understand better? See, that's the difference between Job and Habakkuk right here in Job 38. Verse 1, it says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. This is the point when we've all pushed our parents just a little bit too far. Right? Just that little bit too far, and they go, hey, wait a minute. And we're like, uh-oh, I just pushed too far. Uh-oh, here comes the belt, here comes the shoe, here comes the spatula. I don't know what it was in your family, uh, but here comes something, and it's not going to be good. So what God is saying to Job is, hey, how can you ask me stuff when you have no knowledge? You are so uninformed, how could you possibly judge me? And then he says in verse 12, he says, have you ever in your life commanded the morning and caused the dawn to know its place? Verse 22, have you entered the storehouses of the snow or have you seen the storehouses of the hail? Verse 31, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Ver, uh, chapter 39, do you know the time the mountain goats give birth? Verse 5 in chapter 39, who sent out the wild donkeys free? Verse 9, will the wild ox consent to serve you or will he spend the night at your manger? Verse 26, is it by your understanding that the hawk soars, stretching his wings towards the south? In other words, he's saying, man, how can you ask me when you don't understand anything? I created all of this. How could you possibly ask me these things? 
chapter 40, he said, Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. And then drop down to verse 6. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Or do you have an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like His? God is really, really clear here. Hey, I realize that you don't understand what's going on. But don't judge me. You have no right. This is God stripping us of our pride and inviting us into humility. Understanding, right? Knowledge begins with the fear of God, not the cowering fear, the positional fear. You're God and I'm not. I couldn't possibly judge you and what you do and how you do it because you're God. And then lastly, Job repents of all this. Chapter 32, he says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And he goes on through his entire first half of chapter 42 and repents of doing exactly what we're guilty of every single day. When we look at God and say, how could you let this happen? Why does that go on? What's going on with you? You should do things differently and better for me. Turn to Isaiah. Isaiah is going to be on the other side of Psalms and Proverbs and all that stuff. And I'd like you to go to Isaiah chapter 45. And I'm just going to read you one verse there. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Woe to the one who quarrels with his maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. And listen carefully. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. Woe to him, I'll read two verses. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting, or to a woman, to what are you giving birth? God's really clear in saying, hey, look, I love you enough to let you know that you're not going to understand this, but you need to trust me. So back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk in this section does a little bit differently than Job, but he still queries. He asks the question of the Lord and says, Hey, so can you help me out and help me understand, please? And God answers him. God answers him. And it's not really great what he tells him. If you pick up in verse 6, it says, For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people. These are, this is a portion of the Babylonians, Okay? I'm raising them up. They march throughout the earth, seize uh, dwelling places which are not theirs. They're dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Listen to that. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. They know best. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces move forward. They collect captives like sand. This is not a good thing that's going to happen, God's saying, because these people are mighty. But then jump down to verse 11. He says, Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. Brothers and sisters, how many of us can say, My strength is my God, my idol, me? I'm strong enough. No, no, I don't need to have anyone pray for me. I've got this. No, no, I'm not going to share that need with the church because I've got this enough. I'm okay. No, I, I, I don't need to do that. God's saying, 
Those whose strength is their God will be held guilty. We're not designed for that. We're not designed for that at all. And then the next question comes. The next question comes. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, them, the Babylonians. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct. You're using the Babylonians to do this. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you can't look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? How many of you have said the same thing? How could you let my pagan neighbor down the street who throws these raucous parties, who's doing all this stuff that they shouldn't be doing, I see what goes on there. How could you possibly give that guy a job where he makes $250,000 a year and he stays at home and collects checks? The guy's wicked. How could you do that? Now That's an extreme example. Have you ever thought that yourself? How could you use people that are so evil when I'm not that bad? I'm really not that bad. So why are you using evil people? And then chapter 2, he says, Habakkuk, I'll stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I'll keep watch to see what he, God, will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved when God argues or answers me so do you see Habakkuk taking a half step back and saying hey why are you doing this I'm gonna I'm gonna wait and 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 see what you have to say he's not pointing the finger he's saying could you please help me understand a little bit more and here's the coolest part in verse 2 God answers he says then the Lord answered me and said record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. So, hey, write this down so everybody gets it. So that if they run their eyes over it, they're still going to get it. Make it clear. Make sure that they understand. Verse 3, For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. What does that say in a nutshell? Hey, God's really clear. This is in my time. This is the way I'm going to do things in my time. Sit back and wait, watch, and see which one of these verse 4 characters you are. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. If I trust in God... I stand on the righteous side if I trust. If I rely on my own, my own strength, my pride, then I stand in opposition to righteousness. How many of us do that? What's really interesting here is God God gives that answer and then Habakkuk decides to pile on the Babylonians. And he totally piles on these guys. Verse 5, verse 5, he lists the violations he's seen. He categorizes them. He says in verses 6 through 8, hey, there are greedy lenders out there. Then he goes on in verses 9 through 11, he says, and there are people extorting money out there. And then these Babylonians, you've got rulers there who abuse the poor so that they can build cities to their own amusement and then verses 15 through 17 probably the most graphic in here says woe to you who make your neighbors drink who mix in your venom even to make them drunk so as to look on their nakedness some of these folks are getting people drunk so that they can do all sorts of lascivious things to them And then verses 18 through 20, and this is a key, and I want to read this. Idol worshipers, those that worship inanimate objects. Let's read it together. It says, what profit is the idol when its maker has carved it? 
or an image, a teacher of falsehood, for its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a piece of wood, Awake! To a mute so stone, Arise! And that is your teacher? Behold, it's overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. That's a really nice way of God saying, are you guys nuts? You're looking at a chair that you've upholstered and saying, you are now my God, O chair. Arise, teach me. And God says, hey, I'm in the temple. Shut up. That's what he says. He says, shut up. Let all the earth be silent before him. You ever see the guys, you know, they score a touchdown, and everybody cheers, and they go like this. What's he saying? Yeah, listen, I knew I had this. Oh, I got this one. You don't even need to cheer for me, because there's more coming. God tells them all to shut up. That chair is not going to talk to you. Let's talk about idols for a second. What do you think of when I say the word idol? Think of something like this. I do. I think of a carved wooden totem pole head thingy. Was that an idol that they were talking about at the time? Well, yeah, it was just described a piece of wood, a, a stone, a, who knows, that plant. Could have been anything that these people were putting their trust in. What about today? What's an idol? Money's an idol. What else? Cell phones are an idol. Sure. Computer's an idol. Self is an idol. Let me give you the universal definition here. Anything that takes the place of how we define ourselves and brings us pleasure. That seems awfully broad, but think about it for a minute. In our culture today, we define success in a whole lot of ways. How are we, Christians, people in this congregation, how are we to define ourselves? I am in Christ. Period. End of story. Drop the mic. Walk away. That's it. I am in Christ. I am of Christ. Anything beyond that is just window dressing. Let me tell you about two of my idols. Security and achievement. I like to be secure. I like to know that things are going to be okay. That I'm going to be able to make my bills. That nobody's going to come knocking on the door or or calling on the phone, that medically I can go where I want to to get the care I need. Security is a real big thing for me, and I hold on to that sometimes more often than I trust God. And achievement is an idol for me. I used to define myself by how high in the stack rankings I was, and how big my church was, and how many people came in for counseling on a regular basis, and how many weddings I did, and how many funerals I did, because people would come to me and ask me for those things. Those were my idols. That's how I defined my success. What have you carved out as an idol for your success, your comfort, your escape? I wrote down a few things it might be. Let's see if this hits home. Is it in your 401k? Is it your vacation home? Your bank account? Your house and property? Your children? Your Sunday afternoons and evenings on the couch? Your, insert the blank. What is an idol of your heart? Now listen, none of the things I just listed are wicked things. I'm glad you got a 401k. I'm glad you got a house and property. I'm glad you got kids. I think those are all great things. But when the decision to feed those things, instead of a hunger for what the Lord wants for you, 
then you've got a problem. For much like the Judeans, a Babylon of God's making is coming to root out your idols. God will not, will not be supplanted by an idol of your heart. The Babylonians are coming. They're going to root it out. I've had many idols rooted out in my heart. And I think what Habakkuk is saying is, hey, it doesn't matter what you think should happen or how it should happen or any of those things. God's the one that's going to do the right thing. And we need to trust him. What did God do with his chosen people? When they built the northern kingdom, he sent the Assyrians, then the Babylonians. His will would be done then and his will is done now. History repeats itself. Examples are here for a reason. Let's learn from them. Now, chapter 3, it's only a three-chapter book. Chapter 3 is a psalm within this letter. Habakkuk praises God for all that he is. He begins with this vision of God coming back, or coming at all, actually, to his people in verses 1, 2, and 3. He says a prayer uh, in verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. Shigianoth. Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. Not I'm cowering. I understand that you're God and I'm not. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk was satisfied that God's ways, though not fully comprehensible were the right ways he's saying lord bring back what's important and i know it's going to hurt a lot of people please have mercy as you do that please have mercy as you correct them and he says god comes from timon and the holy one from mount paran selah his splendor covers the heavens and earth the earth is full of his praise. This is that God comes from, all, these are places in Midian or around the Midianites. The, he, God comes from all places and he's going to rush in everywhere. There's not a place that he's not going to be. And the rest of chapter 3 up through verse 15 is a praise of God. It's actually set to music, too, or should be set to music. If you drop down to verse 16, here's what's really remarkable about this. Let's read it. It says, I heard, and my inward parts trembled at the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Here's Habakkuk saying, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm really afraid because I've seen your awesomeness. I see everything that you are, and I know that I have to trust that you're going to do this, but I still have to sit here and watch this destruction that's going to happen. We know Jesus has told us in the New Testament that all of these things have to happen before he will return. That there's going to be death and destruction. There's going to be horrible things that are going to happen, but it has to happen. We have to trust, like Habakkuk did. Even though I don't understand, I still have to trust that you are God. And that you're with me. The last three verses are pretty amazing when you think about it because they kind of are the bow that ties this whole thing together. Verse 17, Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fall and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls. Stop there. In other words, this place is going to be decimated. It's going to look horrible. Nothing good is going to be around. Does he describe in that anything good? No. It's all terrible. And look at the last 
two verses. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. I'm not. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet. Hinds, uh, like gazelle. That's a gazelle. Like gazelle's feet and makes me walk on my high places. What do you know about a gazelle walking on his hind feet? Uh, on his on his feet in the high places have you ever seen that where they jump from rock to rock up on the like way up in the mountains and stuff very very sure-footed they know that they're never going to fall they know that they got it god makes me like that because he is my strength i'm not my strength we learned earlier that if i rely on my strength i will go down to destruction so what highlights does Habakkuk give us? What are things that we might be able to understand here? God's got this. We wouldn't even understand if he told us what he's up to. We have to trust. Especially when things look bad because God is always up to good. Even when he's smashing the bottles and the pottery that he might be able to take those broken pieces and make this beautiful mosaic. We have to trust him. Be a Romans 8.28 believer like Habakkuk was. What does Romans 8.28 say? Anybody know? Romans 8.28. This, I, I swear, when I, when I first became a believer, I said, this is my, this is my life verse. I since have different ones, but it was probably the first thing, first time I ever wrote in my Bible. I said, and we, it says this, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Not some things, not just good things, all things. And Habakkuk is saying, you know what? I can't explain all this stuff, but I trust God. I think he's got it right. And you need to dismantle your idols. You have to identify them. And this is the important part. You've got to put them to death before God sends the Assyrians or Babylonians to do it for you. Because it's going to happen. Here's the beauty. The gospel tells us that we're not alone in that. What does the gospel say? It says that we were with God. We decided sin, our own idols, were more important than God, and we separated from him. And we tried to chase other things. Jesus came and provided the way back to God. And Jesus said, I will never leave you. You will never be alone. So even in rooting out idols, Christ is with us in those things. The early American Indians had a unique practice of training young braves. On the night of a boy's 13th birthday, after learning hunting, scouting, and fishing skills, he was put to one final test. And this did not happen in Bedford, by the way. This is, although it sounds like it may have, hunting, scouting, and fishing skills. He was placed, I, the, the reason I say that is I was out there, we were talking about hunting season, and I got nothing to say besides, wow, that sounds great. Wow, okay, what's a muzzle loader again? Help me out here. I, sounds great. And, and I, I have tons of respect for you guys that do that. I really do. So this is on a boy's 13th birthday. He learns these things, these American Indians. And then he's put to one final test. He's placed in a dense forest to spend the entire night alone. Until then, this 13-year-old had never been away from the security of family and the tribe. But on this night, he was blindfolded and taken several miles away. When he took off the blindfold, he was in the middle of a thick wood, and he was terrified. Every time a twig snapped, he visualized a wild animal ready to pounce. After what seemed like an eternity, dawn broke, and the first rays of sunlight entered the interior of the forest. Looking around, the boy saw flowers, trees, and the outline of the path. Then, to his utter astonishment, he beheld the figure of a man 
standing just a few feet away, armed with a bow and arrow. It was his father. He had been there all night long. Habakkuk teaches us that in the darkness of our own heart, as we root these things out, we have to realize that God is sovereign. God is watching out for us, and He will never leave us. The worst thing we can do is judge the Lord our God when we have no right. He's with you. He's with us.